Thanks. Well, good morning. morning. Can you hear me fine? So I I knew my topic, you know, I I changed my title to flower power. And I knew everyone would come to hear about flower power. So uh, it's always a pleasure to come to the South Dakota Soil Health. I usually do the workshop or the school and then the conference has been nice to come down to. I was actually in Rapid City two weeks ago um, doing virtual fencing. I get to do everything and I get to play in everything. As long as you're willing to not sleep a lot, you can play in a lot of stuff. Um, So I was here for a virtual fencing that workshop and then this one we did, this is a project we did with the Xerces Society. For those of you who don't know the Xerces Society, it's a society that really looks at obviously the value of flowers, wildflowers, and pollinators. And so their whole goal is to create diverse flowering communities for the pollinator community. And they partner with the NRCS uh, in terms of the dollars come on NRCS. And so we wanted to look at the nutritional value and the mineral composition of wildflowers. And you say, well, why would you want to do that? Who, who cares? And when you think about rangelands, you know, and rangelands are a critical habitat for birds and bees and butterflies. It's also our primary grazing base for livestock. You know, their concern was that producers are probably going to spray out more of these flowers if you don't understand the value of flowers in terms of are the nutritional, have a nutritional value to them. And so we looked at, you know, the, the rule of thumb, and if you look at the data on flowers, there's just not a lot of data on nutritional value or the mineral composition of wildflowers. You can look at the list, it's just fairly light to really none. Um, and so that's why we kind of started this, I gotta turn this puppy on, started this project. So the idea of the project is to educate land managers, and I say land managers, it could be a rancher, could be a government agency, could be nature, it could be whoever, on the value of wildflowers, both in terms of, of pollinators and bees and butterflies, in my view, I think the value is even greater than that in terms of the value they provide to soil health, in terms of the root dynamics and architect and what they do in terms of breaking down different, uh, the microbial activity, I think is even greater return than even the above ground side of it. And then of course, looking at the livestock side of it in terms of a forage base. And so there's this view that wildflowers are often viewed as unfavorable. That is a flowering plant's a weed. And I've been doing this job for almost 35 years, and I'll go on to a, a pasture, uh, and you'll see lots of flowers, and it's not uncommon for producers to come, and especially in the past, and say, man, this is a weedy pasture. Why do you have all these weeds? And you look at them like, you know, if it's leafy spurge, that's a weed, don't get me wrong, I agree with that one. But in terms of fl- native flowers, you know, are they really a weed? And you, you can get these, these expressions of flowers that from a distance can look, you know, maybe a little weedy but are they really weedy? And so you get this, this thought that flowers create competition for grasses. That's assuming that cows just eat grass. And of course they don't. There's often viewed as being noxious weeds. What's a noxious, we should have quizzes. What's a noxious, what's the difference between a noxious weed and a, an a obnoxious, non-noxious weed? <laughs> One is, 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 is in law. You have to control it by law. That's a noxious weed. Everything else are not noxious weeds. They are what they are. And then of course, there's this, this thought, some of our flowers are toxic. And, and, and they are, some are toxic. If you listen to Glenn's talk yesterday morning, uh, he talked about cows coming in and, and eating whatever and, and the selection between different species. And within a, within a management strategy, that consumption, it has to take a lot to get death in most flower plants. The one that always gets a lot of knock is milkweed. And you'll read up, milkweed's toxic to cattle. Don't let, the, go spray it out. In 2001, on, on, during our drought, we have a fair amount of milkweed on, on our grasslands. And the cows ate it all. I mean, they literally ate every, and I'm talking millions of plants. It's a function of, of how much they consume per day and then they actually adjust to it. So yeah, you can see death loss with plants. It's, it's fairly rare. And usually there's circumstances to drive to it. So that's why you see this need to control these wildflowers. So what is the forage value of wildflowers? We really don't know a lot about the value of wildflowers. You can think about other broadleafs that we consume, brassicas, uh, your, your legumes. We kind of know what they are. And it's, it's somewhat similar in terms of wildflowers. So we create the, the value of it. The question is, Will they eat it? Do cows eat wildflowers? You know, there's always this conception that they don't eat it anyway. Well, so let's look at that. If they eat the wildflowers, then what is the nutritional value? 
So this is some data from Cook from 1972. And on an average, in a cow's diet, 75% of their intake is grasses. The other 25% is forbs and shrubs. So on an average, about three quarters is the grass. Uh, this, uh, this, so this is a picture of milkweed. And you can see all the tops of these milkweed have been grazed off in, in, th in this picture. This is a western snowberry or buckbrush. And for those of you in the Coteau region up north, we have a lot of buckbrush. And you can get some fairly decent consumption of buckbrush depending on your stocking density and how you utilize that. And so we know we can get some consumption. So this is a trial we did. We've been doing a study up on the grassland station looking at patch burn grazing versus a heterogeneity grazing system. And so we looked at percent utilization of forbs independent of grasses. And so we looked at this high intensity pasture, the take half, leave half pasture, and the moderate use pasture. And you can see on average from the full use to high intensity, we got about 45% degree of use of our forbs. So our cows are eating our forbs. Even on a, on a moderate stocking rate, and this runs about 30%, it's still about 20% use. So if you look at the grass, this is our degree use of our grass. Our goal on this one is to get high intensity, so we're running about 65% is our goal. What's cool in our full use, our degree of disappearance of our grass and forbs were virtually the same. So they really didn't really care. Um, they, they got a, you got about similar use. In the moderate use, of course, we had more in the grasses. Just for comparison, about 15% of the composition is forbs, and about 85% is grasses. And so cows do eat forbs. And if you ever walk out, watch out, walk on the pasture, you can look for those bite marks, and you can see where they're using that. And on the average, they tend to graze high on your broadleaves. All right, so who cares about this at a soil health workshop? And usually we this talk, it's almost always crop systems. You know, and we think about, about soil health, the big push, and we've all talked about it for the last half a decade or longer, is cover crops, right? Why do we implement cover crops? There's an easy answer. Diversity, Diversity and soil health. It's basically the soil health principles. What I'm, and if you look at the principles, I saw it yesterday, Number five that was added about three years ago was the integration of livestock. The, 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 and I'm going to go off topic, but I think livestock are critical on crop crops. So we look at this improved soil health, and, and so you, we always look at a diverse cover crop mix. You try to get diversity in the landscape. One, you get above ground diversity, but the biggest, most important part is this below ground diversity. So even in the soil health side of cropping systems, diversity plays an important value on improving soil health. And so when you look at the gold standard of diversity, rangelands were, I say were, but today you know, kind of are, the gold standard of plant diversity. Today, one of our biggest struggles on grasslands is diversity. We've lost a lot of our diversity on our grasslands. But our gold standard is this diversity. And we, you think about, if you listen to a lot of speakers on cover crops, they always go back a little bit to Mimicking nature, mimicking diversity on grasslands to get that architect within your below ground soil surface. The beauty of, of forbs is that each forb is a little bit different in its architect. If it's a tap root versus a fibrous root versus a lateral roots, they impact different microbial activities. And so you get more activity below ground if you have a diverse forb community. So this is what I think is probably the driver behind it, especially soil health. Um, but above ground still is value for the pollinators. And so that's kind of what we're getting at. If you look at increased plant diversity, for Xerxes Society, they get an increase in pollinator habitat, increase in soil microbial diversity and richness over time. So you get healthier grasslands in the end. So when I first started to give this talk, I was thinking about you know, herbicides. We don't want to spray herbicides. Our biggest issue today is actually our management strategies that have led to monocultures of exotic grasses and lack of diversity. So in the, in the big picture, we need to fix, fix diversity across the landscape, irrelevant of herbicides. So this picture was taken literally about an hour and a half from here. That's brome grass. There is some needle grass near, but that's, to me, that's almost a desert in terms of lack of diversity. So I took another picture literally five minutes later. That's that picture. Big blue stem. Even got some beautiful blue grama grass in here. Western wheat, green needle, got some broadleafs, some forbs in there. This is literally taken five minutes later. And so the difference is management. That's my fence line contrast. I'm not going to tell you where this is at. But this, is, this was managed with fire and grazing. 
One time. This is a one-time disturbance, and that's what you can do at one time. So for me, I left there going, I was excited as hell because I can see like, management can make change. I don't have to worry about herbicide. I got to look at management to get change. And that's what I'm shooting, we're shooting for is this diverse landscape. The more diverse you have, the more resilient you are in terms of grazing management. You get the highs and lows because of lack of diversity. If we get diverse landscapes, your highs and lows kind of go away as, as, a, as a rancher. So I think we need to look, the big picture, this is what we need to look at. So, so let's get into this, try, in this project. So our project was designed to look at wildflower forage quality. We looked at abundant flowers that were used by bees and, and, and butterflies. So we looked at the value for pollinators. Then we want to look at, were they palatable? And then what is the nutritional value of these, of these plants? And then the, the, the outcome of this is to create like a one page sheet of let's say black Samson or milkweed. And so you can look at the value for pollinators and its values for livestock in terms of forage value. So we started this in 2021 and it kind of got started with small. We looked at 15 species. Um, we sampled in the eastern, Deco in, in east, central, western, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska, and we had 141 samples. So in 2022, we kind of went off left field. We, we ended up going 60 more species, 590 samples. We went into Minnesota, Montana, Colorado, Iowa, Oklahoma, California, and Kansas. So we got lots of different plants scattered throughout uh, the western United States. In the end, that, that value of that's gonna be minimal because you got this one-time data collection and it, yeah, it looked kind of cool, um, but it, we kind of went a little overboard. And then last year, we kind of focused, I wanted to look more at phenological differences, differences in location, so your difference in soil types. So we collected 322 samples of 12 different species. We looked at growth stage and location, east, west, and central. There's just a gorgeous plant. I just put this in there because it's a pretty plant. I mean, you see lady slippers? This is a gorgeous plant. And so that's what we did last year. So I'm gonna try and show you some of this data. Um, this is kind of shows you where these plants were collected at in the US. Most of them you see were in the, in the Dakotas. Uh, there's quite a bit of data we got from Eastern Montana. And then we got some out of Nebraska. But today I'm gonna focus on just the Dakota data. Um, so what's the nutritional status? And um, when you look at you know, the mineral consumption, there's just there's no data on minerals. But in terms of nutritional status, that probably has the more biggest value because What's the biggest driver in animal health? It's protein and energy. So what is the protein value? What's the energy value? And then we can look at these minerals as well. So this is some more milkweed. You can see all this milkweed was kind of grazed off. Even our buckbrush was grazed off. Um, so you know we get some consumption. And cows, cows actually like thistle. They like canna thistle in particular. You'll see them come in and eat tops of canna thistle. When it gets a little bit tall and, and a little more spiny, it tends to be a little bit more selective. Um, but they'll eat the thistle as well. So, this is, this is the 2022 data. I know it's noisy, but what is, this is the 60 species that we looked at in 2022. These are all at the flowering stage. And so what you have here is the protein value, 0, 10, 20%. This is the minimum requirements for a 1,400 pound, 1400 pound lactating cow. And so it's interesting, basically 75% of all these plants met the minimum requirements in the flowering stage uh, of a lactating cow. And so when you look at this yellow here would be the equivalent of grass hay value. The green here is the equivalent of a legume hay value. So a lot of these forbs, almost half these forbs have similar quality as a legume hay. Irrelevant of, of the, I'm not gonna give you all the species here. Only two species we called poor quality feed. It was Missouri milk vetch and stiff goldenrod. And so, on an average, you get a higher quality feed base, even at the flowering stage. So yesterday, I got the nutritional data for 2023 at nine o'clock. I'm a little anal, a little OCD, so I had to run that data yesterday. So I sat in the back while everyone was giving these great talks. I'm multitasking, because the data all comes in raw. So I'm trying to sort, and at nine o'clock last night, I had it finished. I did all that for one slide. <laughs> this slide. <laughs> so I just picked, so this is, this is last year's data. This is milkweed. This will be showy milkweed, or common milkweed. This is black Samson, the orange bar here. This is stiff sunflower, and this is the golden run. This is the minimum requirements of a 1,400 pound lactating cow. Vegetative state, flowering stage, bloom stage. What's amazing, milkweed sits at 22% protein in the vegetative state. That's as high as alfalfa. It's a really high quality feed. When I show you the minerals, it's also a really good quality mineral. 
Stiff sunflower tends to be also quite high in nutrition and well as high in minerals. Some species aren't. Some are, you look at stiff goldenrod here, um, which isn't all that palatable anyway. You know, by the flowering stage, it's, at, it's below her requirements. That's the beauty of diversity. Diversity gives you, doesn't really matter as long as something gives you quality and they're picking through there, yes. Are you sampling the way the cow would sample when you or is it no, it's a whole plant sample. So it's going to be skewed, obviously, because they're going to pick for the leaves. And we should have done that, but the, the, the time to do this and the cost, we just did a whole sample. So, it, and that's a great point. It, it, they're going to pick for the leaves and the flowers. So it just gives you a feel for, phenologically, like every plant, they all lose quality as they mature. That's just the way it's going to go. The difference is on, on stiff goldenrod, this post-bloom is actually going to occur in September, for Black Samson, that's going to occur in August. So there's going to be differences among your species. All right, so then if you look at just the legumes, and I'm going to, this is a little bit noisier, but this is the legumes. This is lead plant. This is purple prairie clover. This is American vetch. This is the value in terms of from vegetative state to seed set stage. This is the value of little blue stem. This is the value of needle and thread. If you come across that 10% as your minimum value, you can see all of our legumes always met the minimum requirements. Uh, for a lactating cow. And they're always above the value of our grasses. And so if they're going to pick and choose in here, and cows like lead plant, cows like prairie, purple prairie clover, they're getting a high quality diet when they consume it. Does that make sense? And the important part, my important message is you want to get this diversity across your landscape. So that's the legumes. This was the same graph of the 60 species for total digestible nutrients. That's your energy or your calories. And you can see 93% of our, of our plants were above the minimum requirements of a lactating cow. So there's lots of energy in our flowering plants. It's also true of our grasses for the most part. Our grasses are high in energy in terms of calories. And so all, all of these fell into what I'd call that legume high quality diet for TDN. All right, so let's I look at my time. Let's look at mineral data. To me, to me the mineral data is, is just cool data. And if you think about wildflowers, the one thing wildflowers can do is they can get deep into the soil profile. So they can mine minerals that your grasses aren't mining. And so if you have a mineral down at three and four feet, some of these forbs can get to that, where your grasses, three quarters of the grasses root dynamics are gonna be in the upper one foot. They can get deep, don't get me wrong, but most of it's gonna be the upper one foot. So they can mine that data. And what you, the, the thought was that wildflowers will provide, provide higher levels of minerals needed for growth and reproduction. What we're not trying to say is that if a wildflower has more minerals, it doesn't mean you should not maintain a good mineral program in your livestock herd. Uh, the mineral side is always debate because there's a lot of money in minerals. You know, and so should you do minerals on pasture or not? It's not what we're gonna talk about today because I have an answer for that too, but I'm not gonna do that today. Um, but th look at that, that for reproduction. So I have a series of six slides. They all look the same. And so there's about 10 different grass species, or forb species here. They all have the minimum requirements, which is this blue bar here. This is calcium. There's your minimum requirements at 0.3%. This green bar is data that a grad student of ours did at the grassland station on what the actual value of the grass is in that pasture. And so if you just look at calcium in particular, minimum requirements is about 0.3%. This is what our grass has provided for us. On an average, calcium is one of them few minerals that actually goes up as it matures. So you look at all of these forbs, and we saw this like every year. The for we ran the statistics on this. The forbs never, it's a, a, a double negative, always met the minimum requirements of a lactating cow for calcium. And some run really high. I mean, this one here, this is Black Samson running at 2.5% to as low as 2%. That's a lot of calcium in the diet. This one here, I believe, is, uh, is scarlet globe mallow. Now, how many of you have ever seen a cow eat scarlet globe mallow? Have you? No. <laughs> Doesn't mean, but an antelope will. Um, but you can see that some are pretty high, some are a little bit lower. The beauty of this is they're all above the minimum requirements. So what's our most limited macro mineral on pasture? So for livestock producers, you might know the answer to this. You can say it. Phosphorus, correct, phosphorus. Phosphorus is our most limiting value on our grasslands. That's worldwide. So here's that blue bar. Minimum requirements at 0.2%. And then this is what, what our grass has provided. 
on an average, grasses will provide enough phosphorus till about early to mid-July on most years, but not all years. And they're never high. They're always either adequate or deficient. And it declines throughout the season. So almost all of your mineral programs on pasture tends to add phosphorus. So can cattle select for minerals? What, they can which ones? They can do some. No. Not in the data. Now I say that. Based on the data, cows could only select for salt, like you and I. There's some data that supports phosphorus. That's why you'll see them eating bones. And that's about it. Based on the data. Now there's ranchers will tell me you're a wacko. Because I know they'll look for this and they'll look for that. And if you put them all out. But a lot of our minerals actually don't taste very well. They're, they're not very palatable. Um, but phosphorus is one of those, I think, based on the data and what you read, they can select a little bit for phosphorus. But this is milkweed right here. Look at the milkweed content for phosphorus. It always met the minimum requirements for a lactating cow. This one here is prairie coneflower. Once in a while, you'll see cows eat the top of prairie coneflower. But that, that's usually about it. But you see another high-quality plant in terms of phosphorus. And there are some of those that are deficient. This one here is, um, I believe, purple coneflower which surprised me that it was always below the minimum requirements. So you can see there's some that are above, some that are below. That's your phosphorus con uh, content. Potassium is your third big macro mineral. And all of our species, but, but, but all of our species met the minimum requirement for potassium. Potassium is a fairly easy one to eyeball. If it's green, it's gonna be high in potassium. So if your grass is green, it's gonna be high in potassium. If a broadleaf is green, it's gonna be high in potassium. Some of these maintain it really well. Milkweed, again, really shined, 3.5%, down to as low as 3%, well above memory requirements. Sunflower, and cows like sunflowers, also another high quality in terms of potassium. And so you see a lot of these forbs were well above the minimum requirements for potassium. The other big macro is magnesium. On an average, in, in the northern plains, we tend to be deficient of magnesium in the grass early. And magnesium tends to go up. And you can see it in our, in our study over the two years, our grass was always deficient. Here's your blue line. Here's our grass. And there's a, all of our species <clears throat> that were well above it. In this case, stiff sun, or black samson. And then dotted gay feather. Cows don't eat dotted gay feather either, hardly. But they're another high quality feed in terms of magnesium. So when you look at the data, there, there's always a number of broadleafs that tend to shine in terms of mineral. Uh, content. So let's look at the two biggies. For me, the, the northern plains, most of the U.S., at least in the north and west, are deficient of copper and zinc. Copper is critical for immune function. If we lack copper in the diet, you get issues of poor performance on your calves. You'll see unthriftiness, and you may see them die from something else. It's kind of like you and I. As I get older, my immune system goes down, so I'm more susceptible to whatever. Now, I'm fighting that as best as I can as I get older. Um, but copper is one of those that, if you're a producer, always think about copper in that animal's diet. They can store copper for up to 90 days. So if you have a really good winter program with, your, with copper, they can store it in the liver for about three months. When it does become deficient, they can usually carry that through, as long as your winter program is good. So that's just a lesson there. So here's minimum requirement for a lactating cow is 10 parts per million. Even most of our broadleafs don't meet that requirement. 10 minutes? Sweet. So this is, uh, this is our grass composition. Grasses, on an average, don't retain much copper in their plant tissue. It does vary. The, a wetter fall will give you more copper the next year. But there are some species that were above the minimum requirements. This one here is prairie coneflower, and this is stiff sunflower. So during, the, during that midsummer, we got, pro, we got copper in that diet if they're consuming that plant. So again, the beauty, of, for me, the forbs are well higher than our grasses, and some of them meet that minimum requirement. The last one I have is zinc. Uh, why do we look at zinc? Zinc is important for hoof development. If you become deficient in zinc, you open yourself up to more hoof rot issues, uh, cracking of hooves, which leads to other issues. So zinc's important for that. And so you look at the minimum requirement for zinc is right here, right about 20 parts per million. Here's our grass, right at it, and then it becomes deficient. Look at all these broadleafs that have really high content for zinc. Um, and so uh, this one here is a, a prairie coneflower again, stiff sunflower. My milkweed's still pretty good, um, but there's a lot of different high quality feed sources in terms of zinc content. So when you summarize this data, 
Calcium, potassium, and magnesium levels in wildflowers were high uh, in terms of those mineral content for, for lactating cows. Isn't that a pretty picture? How many have seen the blazing star? They're just a gorgeous plant. Um, I, I just like some, I'm a wildflower kind of guy. So when, when, that, that, when Glenn talked yesterday and talked about 2,300 species, wouldn't that be cool to walk out there and see all that? I'm sure it's not that way today. I'm sure it's a lot less. But so if you look at mineral and potassium, we're gonna have lots of that. Like our grasses, phosphorus levels were deficient in many of our wildflowers once they reached maturity. And so surprisingly, milkweed, scarlet globe mallow, and prairie coneflower provided that adequate level even into the flowering stage or post-flower. We look at copper levels, even though we tended to be deficient, some of our species were high enough compared to our grasses. So it's about a three to seven fold more copper in a, a forb than a grass. And we look at zinc, zinc, I think the zinc levels look really good on this, anywhere from 12 to about 70 parts per million, much higher than our grasses. And so they do give you that suite of opportunities for livestock to consume those wildflowers and get more zinc in the diet. All right, so the most important message today is plant diversity. If you have lots of flowers, lots of diversity, those cows can select and choose. So when Glenn talked about these cows coming through, they graze, He's looking at non-selective. Most of our producers don't graze that way, so they do have a selective nature to them on what they consume. Um, you, you can, if you can increase plant diversity, we can really provide opportunities for providing nutritional quality diet to these livestock and provide habitat for pollinators. This is true of cropland soil health as well. You know, when I talk about cover crops and soil health, I do struggle with a bit on plant diversity because You'll hear this story that more plants is better. Is it true? Do you need 40 plant species in a cover crop mix? I mean, it'd be nice. Can you afford it? When you plant 40 species, how many come up? Maybe 10? You know, so think about when you do cover crops, what's actually gonna grow in there? You want a diversity. Make that diversity a nice mix of cool season, warm season, broadleafs, legumes, different grasses. That's what you're looking for. So a diverse wildflower community will provide more opportunities for livestock to meet the nutritional demands, as well as provide more opportunities for pollinators. And, and we'll also see even different structure use of, of, of wildflowers for birds. Certain birds like different structures, and so you'll see them picked differently based on that, on that structure, structure heterogeneity and diversity. So my last, my last look forward, we, unless it's a noxious weed, we do not promote spraying native wildflowers. Why do you have a mess of wildflowers, negative wildflowers, on your pasture? That's your first question you should talk about. If you don't fix the problem, you'll never get rid of the issue. It's a, so it, it, they're really telling you a symptom. And so if you have an issue of undesirable weeds, that's a management issue. So fix the management. Don't just go out there and try and fix it with a symptom. And last, think about managing these grasslands to increase plant diversity. Uh, if, we can, if we can all do this, I mean, it'd be nice to see what we can do for plant diversity across the landscape with good management. I, so we have a lot of collaborators. So we have NRCS, Xerces Society, a lot of partners. So when you think about 2022, we had people from all over the country going out and picking these wildflowers, and they had to do three different populations, send them to somebody who sent them to me, and then we, we had them all prepped and ground. It was funny, I had a, a, a seasonal going to school at Yale. And I'm like, why are you going to school at Yale? And she's at the research station. She told me why. But she loved to grind our flowers. What a monotonous job. I said, that's a pretty lot of brain power in there to be grinding <laughs> wildflowers. But she did it, and she was very efficient at it. So from there, I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Is that right, Kent? Any questions? Yes? So my cows aren't selecting for minerals in the form that they consume. So the question was, why are they picking certain forbs? And, and I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, if put in your management, sometimes they just, they just don't select. And some species will like something in terms of, it's usually taste. Taste will drive selection. Unless your selection process is, your density is high enough, they just graze and they just eat everything. I think there's, there's times when tannins or secondary compounds play a role and but I, if you, it's hard to say 
they're picking a plant because it's high in copper. Because they really can't tell that. I think it's other things that drive it. Now they may, like you and I, we can tell them we're a little bit off. We might, I might go eat some sugar <laughs> or whatever. You know, I think cows are very similar. They're, they're, and each one's individual. I, and we don't know. I mean, right now it's still a guessing game. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we've had, we had a pasture that got hailed off a couple years in a row, didn't really get grazed. Okay. And, and then like this last year, we had quite a more rain than we normally had for the last couple of years. Anyway, lots of sunflowers. Mm -hmm. What does that, I mean, when you see lots of sunflowers, I mean, we didn't have a problem with it, but we'd always kind of heard, I don't know if it's wife's tail or whatever, if there's lots of sunflowers, it's good that the sunflowers are there because then eventually something else better will be coming. I don't know what, what was, you know, when you see that. So her question was, why do we see these these influxions of certain species based on environmental effects. And disturbance, so one, you had a hail disturbance. I can do it with cattle. I can come in and do a heavy disturbance. And if I got moisture, certain species respond. Uh, prairie coneflower is a classic example, like sunflower. They express themselves really well after heavy disturbance. You'll see it with goldenrods as well. And they do this. And then eventually, they come back. They kind of fix themselves in terms, they can only handle so much competition, so much light, lack of light, too much light. And so you get these ebb and flows of expression. You can manage a, a pasture to create expression of grasses fairly easy. Flowers take the, the, also the level of moisture or lack of moisture that drives that. And so to see these ebb and flows is naturally occurring, should occur. Um, and so that, it's just fun to watch them, though, especially because there's some years when we got a huge flush of crocuses. I love crocuses. And that really drives last year's fall moisture. Fall, so you get some fall moisture. All of a sudden, you get these really good flushes of crocuses. How many knew that crocuses are the only plant we have that flowers before it produces a leaf? It's the only one that, that does that. It's pretty cool. That's a great question, and that's just part of nature. But disturbance can, can really express more than others. Yes, sir. Building off of this gentleman's question, um, if the cows aren't going to be selecting for any kind of minerals, why not have a dedicated wildflower pasture and say, okay, well, I'm not going to give you a choice. Go in there for a few days and eat some wildflowers. I'll let you back out to the grass pastures. You could do that. Nothing wrong with that. You know, the, the, that's a small scale, you know, trying to, trying to, do, trying to look at creating diversity and, and, and that impact. The one that, that's really important on the minerals, though, <laughs> is the minerals have to be in the soil. And so certain plants can, can capture the minerals better than others. That's why you see differences, highs and lows. We just lack certain minerals in our soil profiles in this country. And so that's why we don't see a lot of, a lot of copper. Phosphorus is also a, another issue. The beauty of phosphorus is cows can mobilize phosphorus from the bone when they need it and put it back. So there's a little bit of plus there. But I mean, that's nothing wrong with doing that idea if you want to do that. And you're creating habitat for pollinators. Is my time up? All right. Are you getting that? Thank you. <laughs>